Welcome back to another episode of the North Star Takes Podcast. I'm Bailey Paulicki. He's Jacob Liberta, and we're a Minnesota sports podcast. And if you're a Minnesota Vikings fan, click the like button on this video because we're going to be breaking down some of the latest headlines coming out of Vikings training camp. Um, it's been a little while since we've done a video, but I figured, you know, start uh, start a training camp here. We got some storylines and we're, you know, coming up on the first preseason game here against the Raiders. So let's just jump right into it here, Liberta. Um Probably the number one topic so far of this training camp has been that Garrett Bradbury appears to, even though he claims to have put on weight, he appears to still be struggling. Um, Harrison Phillips has just been eating his lunch. And, uh, I mean, it's it's been a struggle for Bradbury. He's in his fourth year. They didn't pick up his fifth-year option. But they also didn't do anything in the offseason to really kind of help bolster the depth behind him. What do you make of Garrett Bradbury continuing to struggle here? And do you think this is, you know, a thing that could really hold this team back going forward? Man, I, I think everybody but this new leadership in place for the Vikings saw this coming. I think everybody's very wary about basically continuing on this Garrett Bradbury experiment that we have here and going into another season with him supposedly going to be the the starting center. And it's just mm-hmm. we're getting the same results as we've all seen for years now, basically since he got here into, into camp rookie – in his rookie season it's like this guy this guy can't play as far as the nfl goes maybe he can be a backup somewhere but he should not be a starter like you said i mean you're getting the results uh phillips just bodying him every practice every day going out there and like you said that uh, eating his lunch i mean it's just ridiculous because he heard the same things last year with michael pierce it's like oh michael pierce is dominating like oh we thought michael pierce is good and in truth like michael pierce is a pretty solid player and so is harrison yeah. phillips but at the same time like they're they're not like the best of the best in the league or anything like Bradbury should still be doing all right right now. Yeah, they're and not Aaron Donald. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And it, I know it's a new offense, new system, new scheme, whatever, this and that. But like it comes down to is uh, for people smarter than I am as far as like football, like nitty gritty football details go. Like they said, his technique is still bad. And like this guy still can't just hold hold his own really in pass protection. The, the story has never been him and – run blocking like he's been fine there like we've we've been able to establish a good zone scheme with Dalvin now for a few years uh, yeah. and it's just it comes on pass blocking though because when he's just getting bullied then he's falling right in a Kirk's lap and when you got guys just right right in front of Kirk there when the play starts it's like we're doomed to fail because this guy can't move very well to begin with so like when you're doing that then our opportunities become very limited and I know K- KOC came in there and he's he's a guy that thinks like oh I, I can be the one that fixes Bradbury if nothing else we could scheme around it like we can kind of get away with it and cut corners there but we can't we need some guy that's going to be a solidified leader of this offensive line be able to command it and just not just be average like we don't need somebody to be great here we just need somebody to be average so then basically our guards will look a little bit better too and we already have in my opinion really good tackles on the outside yes. both on the left and right side Darius has coming in his own O'Neal's been established for a couple of years now so it's like we have a good unit overall but it's like one it's a weak leg unit so it's like this, if the center is bad then the, the whole thing looks bad and that can really destroy a whole offense and take it down a massive notch more than people can even realize really so this this concerns me a lot and considering we don't have like a great backup plan like chris reed i know he was actually flashed quite a bit for the colts last year in a backup offensive lineman role and he played well guard but like he's never played center or had any snaps there in an actual game so like that's that's a huge question mark, and that's probably our best option really behind Bradbury as far as in-house goes. So then you look around the league, and it's like, where are you really going to find a center that's going to be like more than marginally better than Bradbury or Reed? Like, yeah, teams just don't trade those guys away. So then you're talking about J.C. Treader. I don't know what the deal is there as far as why teams aren't really giving them a look. Which I guess just is what it is at this point. I'm not going to even hope so for that by any means. So it's like, well, where does that leave us? I mean, I – I got major major reservations here, but the good news is, and we're going to talk about this in the uh, topics to come here, that this is kind of my big, big worry about this team in general. Everything else feels pretty all right, but this is where I definitely hit the panic button. Yeah, for sure. And just kind of to add on to like, where do we go from here? Apparently there was a report today from Doogie that the Vikings have have talked about potentially trading for a center. I don't know who that might be. It's probably, it would probably be a backup from another team. I, I couldn't imagine another team's going to trade their starting center. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on as well. Yeah, the treader thing remains a mystery. I'm, whether it's you know him being the head of the NFLPA or maybe his yeah. knees are shot, I don't really know what the deal is there. But 
I mean, that guy would definitely be better than Bradbury. I don't care if he can't practice. Like, I mean, as long as he can play on Sundays, I guess I don't really care. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's concerning. I mean, we've seen seen the same thing year year after year, and really, I think it's almost like Bradbury's gotten worse in pass protection. I feel like his rookie year he wasn't amazing, but it wasn't like a huge red flag. I didn't think, True. but it True. feels like it's just gone downhill ever since then. Maybe teams have kind of figured out how to attack him best. But the fastest way to the quarterback is right up the gut, and if they can get by Bradbury, it's going to be a long day for Kirk Cousins. So. Uh, center battle is definitely something to keep an eye on. You know, maybe Chris Reed can improve and, you know, maybe take that spot. Yeah, and just getting a guy that's serviceable in pass protection that's not getting bullied yes. as much as he does as far as pressures allowed goes. Because you think about it like Kirk, for instance, being able to actually step up in the pocket could be a revelation for this offense on its own and yeah. be able to step into throws and basically allow him to maybe throw it off field a little bit more, not on play action. So it's like, man, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, no kidding. Well, let's move on to the backup quarterback battle here, Liberta. Uh, between Kellen Mond and Sean Mannion, they just released their first depth chart. And at the backup quarterback position, it says Kellen Mond or Sean Mannion. Uh, not really given either one of them the number two spot, I'm guessing, because they haven't been too impressed with either one. And sure. you and I were at training camp uh, for the night practice that Monday night. And, I mean, neither one really looked amazing. None of the quarterbacks really did that night, honestly. But, um I mean, what do you make of this? Are you a little concerned that Kellen Mond really hasn't started to solidify himself yet as like a clear-cut backup quarterback? Yeah, I'm a little bit worried here in the reports that we've heard so far. And like you said, we went to that night practice and it just weren't very impressed. I mean, really offensively, we didn't show too much that night. But yep. I, it's it's a little bit – makes me a little bit worried. But at the same time, this is all kind of moot if like Kirk is Kirk and he's as durable as he's ever been. Like that, it really doesn't matter who the backup quarterback is. But uh, you always got to plan for a worst case scenario sometimes. So mm -hmm. I think this does make me a little bit nervous. And I think we got to start peeking around at uh, what our options are that aren't in house to be the backup quarterback to Kirk. So it is. It does kind of disappoint me. I loved Mon coming out of the draft. I think he has all the really natural ability, all the physical talent to probably be a pretty decent quarterback, but it's just, I don't, I don't think he processes things fast enough or at least at this point. So I don't know if I feel great right now about going into the season with him as a backup, but I'm also willing to obviously see how this plays out over a couple of preseason games too, and see what they look like in actual game scenarios. Cause I know it's one thing to get on the practice field and sling it around a little bit or maybe take your time as far as progressing through reads. That's practice, but Maybe it looks a little different in games, but yeah, right now early indications aren't great. And I certainly don't want Sean Mannion to be the no. be the guy actually playing on Sundays if Kirk isn't going if Kirk isn't going to. Like sure, you can keep Mannion and get your jollies of having him on the roster, being able to talk to Kirk during the week, give him his cup of coffee, fill yeah. his clipboard, whatever. But uh as far as when it comes to playing in a game, we all saw what happened in Green Bay last year. It was no surprise considering the starts he's made in his NFL career. Never won a game yet, so I'm out on that. So that's mm -hmm. either Mond or we need to look elsewhere. I agree. If Kellen Mond's not going to be the guy, then you got to wait till some guys get cut. Um, there will be some quarterbacks on the trading block, I'm sure. Um, I think like Blake Bortles is still out there. I'm not sure if he's sure. in a. If, I'm not sure if he's even in a training camp right now. Like I mean, at least that's a guy that started. I a handful yes. of games. Absolutely. He's even played in the playoffs with an AFC championship. So, like, yeah, right. I could I could get behind Blake Bortles being our backup quarterback. Yeah, because, like, you know, hopefully worst case scenario is just a couple games or something. You know, God forbid Kirk finally gets an injury. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's concerning, and I agree with you. I think he's got all the physical tools, Kellen Mond, that is. But, you know, it's just the processing isn't quite there. You can tell he's taking a long time to figure out where to go with the ball. Yeah. Um, you know, granted, the, the backup offensive line doesn't really do him any favors either necessarily, but. And it's um, just, you love those highlight reel throws. Like the other day, I don't know uh, if everybody saw this or not, but I, I think the Vikings tweeted themselves or maybe mm -hmm. somebody else, but that roll to his left, he threw against his body down the field. Like, that was a nice throw on his right yes. side. But at, at the same time, like, you'd obviously want to see some more consistency too. For sure. All right, let's move on to the right guard competition here, Liberta, because this is actually probably a very promising storyline. It seemed as if. Uh, maybe going into camp, it would be between Jesse Davis and maybe Chris Reed as well. That was before we knew knew he'd be moving to center. But all of a sudden here, Ed Ingram's really starting to make a name for himself. Um, he was a clear-cut number two right guard after Chris Reed had moved to center. Um, obviously, just nothing from Wyatt Davis, which is another topic for another day. I mean, that guy's probably going to get cut in his second year sure. as a third-round pick. But Ed Ingram. Now, all of a sudden, he's pushing for some first-team reps. Um, before, it was just on days that where Jesse Davis was getting a rest day. But 
But now, uh, a couple days ago, Jesse Davis was practicing, and they still had Ed Reed, and they're taking some first-team snaps. So, I mean, what do you think about this, Alberta? Drafting a guy in the second round, you and I really didn't know much about him other than he was on a really good LSU team, and he was on that LSU team that won the championship. So, he, you know, he's got that kind of – uh, championship mentality. He knows what what it takes to get to that level, at least in college. I mean, what do you think about having a rookie like this come in and impress on the offensive line like this? This is highly fascinating. I am curious if this has more to do with their uncertainty about Jesse Davis. And I know he's got injury concerns and he's got bad knees, I believe it is. And so maybe they just don't feel great about him. He's one of those guard tackles. Or yeah. Guard slash tackles. I I don't like him at all. Anybody who knows me as far and talking Vikings with me knows I don't like Jesse Davis, and that's not the guy I want to go into the season with. So this is big for me that we're giving Ingram a long look, just because that it's got to be at least a little bit of him that he's getting first team reps. Looks like he's ready for it. Like that's great because he's also a true guard. Like that's what he played his yep. entire college career too, which I love. Like we're not doing the usual Vikings thing in the offensive line where we're shifting positions, be like, hey, you're a left tackle. We're not going to be playing right guard. And I can't stand that. It's like last year having our four left tackles on the offensive line. That was stupid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then look at the result we got. But you consider Ed Ingram here, again, like you said, we, we didn't know a lot about him. That was, a, that was quite a surprise for me when we took him there in the second round this year. I did not see an offensive lineman on the radar, really. I, right. I guess, granted, we didn't really know we had Y. Davis, and that apparently is nothing. But uh, Ingram, I, I think that's great. I think if he's already getting uh, reps right now, I I think he's got to be the front runner then to be the right guard come week one when we play Green Bay, just because I, I don't think – uh, the rookie would be getting looks this early if it wasn't like he was trending in the right direction towards that. So I'm very excited about this. And we, I mean, we saw him the other night. He looks like a big dude too, which yeah. I, love. I want to have these just maulers on the offensive line. I think that'd be great. I think that brings an extra physicality to your team that just gives you an inch. Yeah. I think as long as he has some solid preseason showings here in the games, I think he's going to be the starting right guard. And then, yeah. you know, as long as he can kind of hang in there, and kind of have a decent season like Ezra Cleveland did his rookie year, and then he was able to build on that, even switching positions last year. Um, I think, you know, the sky is the limit for this guy. And then all of a sudden you have four of your five positions of the offensive line solidified. And what's the last you time we had that? Exactly. You'd have just center remaining, which means you could go and get a free agent if you really wanted to solidify it right away. You yes. could take a couple shots in the draft, you know, pick a couple centers. Um, you know, not necessarily right away because, I mean, picking a center in the first round I don't think is really the move. But in the mid mid to late rounds, pick a couple centers and have a comp, have a true competition there. But, um, yeah, super excited about Ed Ingram. Obviously, you know, it was a little questionable when they made the draft pick and he had some, you know, questionable stuff in his past, um, some legal issues. But, I mean, hopefully all that stuff is behind him now. Hopefully he's got his head on straight. And, you know, I just – we could really use a really good player at right guard because it's been such a weakness for such a long time. I mean, you go back to the Mike Remmers days. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of all the scrubs we've had playing right guard for us the last few years. I mean, it's been well, really last rough. year was Udo. Yeah, Ole Udo, uh, Dakota <laughs> Dozier. Like it's just been it's been a revolving door at right guard. So if if Ed Ingram can come in and just hold that spot down, that's going to be massive. Especially you know when you have a quarterback that isn't the most mobile and likes to stay in the pocket. Um, you have four guys that you can pretty much trust um, to keep guys out of Kirk's face. And then, you know, maybe they're also, you know, between Ezra Cleveland and Ed Ingram, maybe they're flexible enough to be able to help Garrett Bradbury, you know, throw a chip or something and then get over to hit their guy. Sure. Just all the, all these little things that can maybe help out Bradbury as well. So because um, if you have two good guards around Bradbury, I mean, hopefully you'd think that helps him a little bit. But, I mean, who knows? If it's one-on-one, -on -one, there's not much they can do. But let's move on to the edge rushers. Because this is another good talker. I mean, obviously, Daniil Hunter is back to form. Uh, like, he's never been hurt. And, I mean, honestly, the guy is just, you know, so well conditioned. He's just absolutely jacked. Like, there's no concern about this guy physically. And, you know, he's still in the prime of his career. So, I think he's still going to have a very good season. Zadarius Smith is looking awesome so far. Really, for him, it's just about can he stay healthy. And then even the backups, DJ Wanham, uh, Patrick Jones, I think they both had some solid training camps so far, kind of showing some promise. And I think those are their, you know, good roles for them. DJ Wanham probably shouldn't be a starting edge rusher. But, I mean, as a backup in a situational role, I think he's a decent player. So what are your thoughts on the edge rushers? Yeah, I heard this room has been really this training camp. I think, obviously, it starts with our our two big names there that you mentioned off the top with Daniel Hunter and Zadarius Smith. Both of those guys have proven track records in the NFL 
as far as being able to generate big pressure numbers, big sack numbers. And I think these guys all both sent out healthy. It's not the talent or being able to do it when they're on the field like they can. It's just, yeah, staying on the field for this year in a 17 game season, hopefully playing 16 games, 15, 16 games, something like that. Yeah. So I think that that helps us tremendously when they're on the field just because I think a defense really starts with an edge rush. And when you're generating uh, really pressure, then it's going to make the quarterback's life a lot more difficult. They're going to have to make quicker decisions, which can cause more mistakes. And it's also going to leave your DBs, like, I guess, not hope to try so much. And you're going to be able to shorten the play for them and be able to give them a chance to really make plays on the ball and really yeah. do some things that will create turnovers and give us more chances offensively, which obviously you, you want to have. But, yeah, I'm really excited about them, obviously the starters. And then you go beyond that. Even I heard a lot of good things with Patrick Jones so far. So pretty excited about what he's got. We we don't really know a lot about him just because he didn't play mm-hmm. a lot last year. He's one of those – uh, four third round picks we had last year in the last Spielman draft. So I'm curious what he looks like. And they maybe, uh, I mean, he had no role, so an expanded role for him, which should be any snaps at all. So I kind of want to see him get some looks and probably going to get a lot of that in preseason. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to see what the, this group as a collective can do this year. Like hopefully we can be a, uh, I would say since we were a top 10 unit, I mean, we're, towards the top, very top, and sacks last year before Hunter got hurt. So maybe we yeah. can be a top 10 unit in that again. And I think that would go a long ways towards making this uh, defense at least formidable. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, I think if Neil Hunter plays all 17 games, he can really push in the upper teens, maybe even 20 sacks. I mean, he's just that special of a player. So um, the Vikings haven't had a good edge rush in a couple of years, and that's mostly due to Daniel Hunter injuries yeah. and Everson Griffin kind of falling off as well. But I mean, they've been known for their edge rushing for so long, going back to Jared Allen and Ray Edwards, and then you bring in Everson Griffin, Brian Robinson, Daniel Hunter. I mean, so many good edge rushers in the in the last you know decade for this team. So, um, you know, hopefully they can get back to that. And as long as Zadari Smith and Daniel Hunter stay healthy, I have absolutely no doubt that they will. So, um, let's kind of move on here to the corner battle as well, Alberta. I mean, Patrick Peterson's obviously locked into a starting spot at least for now, until he starts to show maybe some age and drop off. And then you got Cam Dantzler, who's, you know, holding down that other starting outside corner spot, which I think you and I kind of, um, you know, predicted that would happen. I think we expected that out of Dantzler. But there was a lot of media, um, people that cover the team that really think like, oh, yeah, Andrew Booth is going to take over for Cam Dantzler. And you and I are of the mindset that Dantzler is actually pretty decent. I mean, he had some up and downs last year, no question. He had a pretty good rookie year, all things considered. Um, but yeah, he was in Zim's doghouse from the start last year, you know, maybe emotionally he didn't handle it the best, but then I thought throughout the season, he ended up playing pretty well. Um, he's added some muscle this year. You can tell he's a little bigger. I just, I, I mean, I have, I have faith in this guy and, you know, obviously you'd want both these guys to be good because Patrick Peterson's not going to play forever. You probably only have him for one more season, honestly. Um, so what are your thoughts on these two both just, you know, having a solid camp so far? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm feeling pretty good about Dancer. Like you said, I, I was surprised to see as much steam as there was about Booth getting serious looks as being the starting corner opposite Patrick Peterson just because they're like he's a rookie. Like, you don't usually do that unless you have to as yeah. far as starting corners go. And I don't know, maybe that's – maybe I'm brainwashed by the whole Zim days thing where you just don't play rookies. But – at, at the same time, like, Dantzler, he's a, he's a dude. He's a starter. I, this guy was, according to PFF, was number one against the run as far as corners go last year. So, like, that's pretty significant. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd like to have that guy on the field, and especially when he considers band man coverage. Like, as far as the eye test goes last year, it looked fine. So, it's just I, I think this guy is more than capable of being a good starter for us. And I know Booth, that's great that he's really challenging this much to really create this, I guess, supposed controversy. But – I, I think Booth would be a nice player later on, but like if we can avoid rookie corners, it's a pretty hard position to really get up to speed with in the NFL. Yeah. So I think Dancer's got to be the guy, and I think he'll I think he'll have a great season. I I think he's been getting better and better every day at camp this year too, and he's also a guy I would personally to put into context with former Vikings and everything. I personally put him right in between like peak Xavier Rhodes, like 2017 Rhodes, and he's like arguably the best corner in football, but also mm-hmm. like a really solid number two, Trey Waynes. I think Dancer's a little bit better than Waynes was back then. So yes. I think I think this guy is very capable, and hopefully Booth uh, along the lines becomes even more of an alpha where he can be like a number one corner, where Dancer, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if that 
if it's ever going to get to that, just because now he's been a league three years, but he is getting better. So you never know. But right. this could be this will be a big year for him. But Booth, I don't know. He certainly's got the personality, I should say, for being a number one corner in this league. So hopefully, I mean, with injuries to this team, like there always is, especially when uh, the cornerback room, I feel like I think you'll still see plenty of Booth, regardless if he's starting week one or not. So yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what he's got too. But yeah, I feel pretty good about our starter as far as corners go. But I get a little bit more. A bit more worried if we got to dip into the backups too much because I like at these three guys with Taco Pepe and then Dantzler and and Booth and then Shannon Sullivan I think will hopefully be league average as far as the nickel corner goes but beyond yep. that man a lot of question marks don't probably want to yeah. see those guys play any snaps defensively so hopefully we can uh, stay mostly healthy there too it sounds like a Caleb Evans has had a pretty decent camp but then True. he's been he's been injured the last couple practices but I mean, from my understanding, he's a pretty raw prospect. So, like you said, I mean, hopefully you don't have to force him into game action. It kind of makes you wonder what other corners they keep on the roster. You still got like a Harrison Hand, um, Chris, Boyd. Chris Boyd is still yeah. in the mix, and like you know, Nate Harrison, Nate Harrison, yeah, yeah. Uh, Perry Nickerson. Yep. Um, so they got they got all these different options, but I think a lot of those you know back end guys are more slot corners. I know a Caleb Evans is outside, but I think Harrison Hand is typically like a slot corner. Uh, Nickerson is for sure. So. I need um, somebody to back up Sullivan in case he gets yes. hurt. Yes, they do. And maybe, you know, maybe they have options there where they can slide a Cam Bynum in and play with a three, almost a three safety look. Maybe sure. they can move Pat P to the slot if an injury occurs, you know, something along those lines. So um, any other final thoughts from you on anything else that's been sticking out in training camp before we take off here? Yeah, I feel like we're a little thin at tight end. This doesn't really bother me that much just because I don't think uh, – the tight ends, the biggest worry in this new offense that we're about to deploy, really. I think this is going to heavily utilize our wide receivers, so tight ends become more of a more or less of a non-factor. Yep. But it's just like if you have it, then great. That's just great. Be on top, like Irv Smith, I think could pull right in and uh, and play a huge role in this offense. But if he's not there, it's like it's not the end of the world. Granted, the Vikings have played below him too for how long now so it's yeah. like nothing new there and then as far as o'connell's offense goes like i don't think it's really heavily predicated on the tight ends outside of like run blocking so it probably doesn't matter that much that we don't don't have any dudes there behind smith but mm-hmm. as, as long as they can run block i guess from uh johnny Munt to uh, ellison i mean all these guys that we got there uh, davidson i know poses more as a receiver i would say but i, yeah. I guess something something worth noting is that it feels like we're pretty thin at tight end yeah, I would agree with you there. And what I'm kind of looking at, too, is how this wide receiver battle is shaking out. We know the top three is solidified, and it really sounds like K.J. Osborne looks even better this season. And yeah, there are huge. some yeah, there are some people that think he could maybe you know overtake Adam Thielen at some point this year as the wide receiver, too. I mean, if that does happen, that'd be great to see that because then you have some really good depth at wide receiver. But, yeah. you know, outside of those top three, I'm looking at Amir Smith-Marset. Can he lock down that number four spot? Can he actually get some run at wide receiver this season, yeah. you know, using his speed, getting him down the field? Is BC Johnson going to hang on to that number five spot? I mean, it's kind of between him or like a Jalen Naylor, potentially Albert Wilson, although I don't think Albert Wilson's going to make the roster. Sure. And then, then you got some guys, you know, some practice squad type guys that are kind of trying to make an impression, both Myron Mitchell and Tristan Jackson. We saw Tristan Jackson kind of flash at training camp when we went. Yeah. Um, he's been having a pretty decent camp so far. So there's actually, there's quite a bit of competition. I mean, I'd imagine they keep six receivers. I didn't even mention like Dan Chisena, who obviously is a special yeah. teams guy, but like, True. Um, I mean, there's a lot of receivers battling out for, you know, those six spots. Yeah. What, what do you think of uh, Mir Smith Marset being the top, being the punt returner, like the starting punt returner right now on the Vikings uh, initial depth chart release? What do you think of that? I'm good with that. I mean, as long as he can catch the ball back there, I have zero doubts about his ability to actually, like, run the ball. So, like, I mean, obviously he's one of the fastest players on the team. So as long as he can, you know, be smart back there, you know, know when to fair catch and actually catch the ball, I don't I don't have any reservations about it. If I remember correctly, I don't know if he returned any kicks last year in the regular season, but I know he returned kicks in the preseason. Yeah. Um, but it, I don't know if it was ever punts. It might have just been kickoffs. So I think it was just kicks, yeah. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see if, if he's actually able to do it or not. But I know they've been like testing KJ Osborne, and I really don't want to try that experiment again. And there's no need. You don't if want he, him to get hurt back there either. Exactly. There's no need if he's going to have a big role on offense. So, mm-hmm. I mean, hopefully, you know, Inwagu is going to be your kick returner, but I mean, maybe a guy like Ty Chandler can be a returner too. I don't know if they've been testing him back there or not. But yeah, Amir Smith Marset, 
I say might as well give him a shot. And Jalen Naylor is kind of intriguing, too, with his speed. Sure. <clears throat> All right. That will do it for this edition of the North Star Takes podcast. Please be sure to click the like button on this video and subscribe to our channel, especially if you're a Minnesota sports fan. Uh, feel free to follow us on both Twitter and Instagram. And let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. What do you think about what's been going on in Vikings training camp so far? What are you most concerned about? What are you most intrigued by? And things you're looking forward to as the preseason games uh, start kicking off here. So until next time, thanks for watching.